emergency vehicles. Transportation between cities would be by monorail. The Central Dome will eventually house a cybernated complex, which serves as the brain and nervous system of the entire city. It projects a 3D virtual image of Earth using satellite communication systems which display information on weather, agriculture, transportation, and the operation of the whole city. This cybernated system will use environmental sensors to help maintain a balanced load economy which avoids overruns and shortages. For example, in the agricultural belt, electronic probes monitor and maintain the soil conditions, water table, nutrients, and more. This method of electronic feedback can be applied to the entire city complex. With computers now able to process trillions of bits of information per second, they are vital for arriving at correct decisions for the management of these innovative cities. Some of the cities may be total enclosure systems, which are self-sufficient. These massive structures would contain residences, parks, recreation, entertainment, healthcare, educational facilities, and more. Everything built in these cities would be as near to a self-contained system as conditions allow. In these total enclosure arrangements, the skyscraper assures that more land is available for parks and wilderness preserves while at the same time eliminating urban sprawl. Wherever possible, geothermal energy can be harnessed. Geothermal power offers the possibility of an abundant source of clean energy. This source alone could provide enough energy for the next thousand years. National transportation systems would include a network of waterways and canals. These bodies of water could minimize the threat of floods and droughts by diverting floodwaters to storage basins. In addition, these canals could supply water for irrigation, fish farms, and recreation. <coughs> the canals can also be used for desalinization using a method of evaporative condensation. A network of tunnels could facilitate transportation of passengers and freight across the Sahara Desert to all the Arab nations free of the effects of sandstorms. These tunnels will be located 30 to 40 feet below the desert surface, with ventilators every thousand feet. Water could be pumped from below the surface of the Sahara and transported to all the Arab nations. In some instances, ships could serve as floating automated plants, capable of processing raw materials into finished products while en route to their destinations. Huge ships and submarines, with many removable and interchangeable compartments, will carry freight across the oceans. Rather than separate containers, an entire freight section can be automatically disengaged at the port. Bridge designs would be greatly simplified and bridges can be made corrosion resistant. They would be prefabricated and transported to the site by twin-hulled catamarans. On some bridges, trains could be suspended beneath traffic lanes. Colonization of the oceans is one of the last frontiers remaining on Earth. Prodigious oceanic city communities will evolve as artificial islands, floating structures, undersea observatories, and more. These large marine structures are designed to explore the relatively untapped riches of the oceans and provide improved mariculture, freshwater production, energy, and mining. This could offset land-based shortages. They could also provide almost unlimited riches in pharmaceuticals, chemicals, fertilizers, minerals, oil, and natural gas. Ocean cities would be resistant to earthquakes, and greatly relieve land-based population pressures. The population would vary from several hundred to many thousand. Underwater oceanic viewing and research facilities provide expansive panoramic observations of the undersea world in its natural habitat without disturbing the ocean environment. Unsinkable floating sea domes will attract those who prefer unique offshore or island living. In the event of inclement weather, they could easily be towed ashore mounted and anchored to elevated support structures. 
Mariculture and sea farming systems are used to cultivate and raise fish and other forms of marine life to help meet nutritional needs. These marine enclosures are designed as non-contaminating integral parts of the ocean environment. A true world's fair of the future will emphasize the contributions made by all nations toward advancing humanity. Although this fair will provide entertainment, its main function is to deepen understanding of the world we live in and the people who inhabit it. The architectural structures themselves will be jewels of future possibilities with a wide variety of exhibition buildings. Many of the displays will depict not what the future will be, but what it can be if we use science and technology with human and environmental concerns. It could be a vivid future showcase of the human potential. Videos, three-dimensional displays, and full-size dioramas will depict the fabulous advantages for all nations when working together to preserve the greatest gift we have, the resources and beauty of our planet Earth. In the final analysis, we are one people and share one planet. If you desire more information on any of the systems seen in this video, visit our website at www.thevenusproject.com.
those damn niggers is what they speak. I'm not mimicating them. They say things like, I'm old, get me a nigger, and I'm going to kick his ass. That environment, the expressions, the facial movements are picked up by the environment. It's not human behavior, it's the environment we come from which generates behavior. Now, if you brought it in Italy, you say, come on, they eat, there's a bugger food. Now, that is not, that's the way you would speak if you were brought up there. Viva la France, Deutschland over others, Germany above all. Now, we are victims of culture, all of us. That's why we have a distorted view. We believe that some people are good, some are bad, some are creative, some are less creative. All that's bunk. Everyone can be creative. Now, they tell you in your schools that plants grow. That's a lie. They need water, sunshine, soil, moisture, gravity, all those things. Without them, the plant, plant doesn't move. They tell you that sailboats sail. They don't sail, they're acted upon by the wind. There is nothing in the earth today that is not acted upon by resident forces, meaning your way you think, the way you move, your facial expressions. Girls behave differently than men, not because they're women. Because if a normal boy is brought up by six women, very abundant women, and they say, oh, did I see a gorgeous hat? That boy will speak just that way. <laughs> and if you brought up in France, you'll speak with a French accent or a French-English accent. If you live in France 10 years, you move to Germany, you live there 10 years, you speak with a German-French accent. Not a thing you can do about it. So your facial expressions and your language was designed hundreds of years ago. That's why we can't talk to each other. We talk at one another, not to one another. Now, a lot of people don't understand that, so I say that the Bible, when you read it, he says, Jesus meant this. He says, oh no, he meant that. And the third verse says, you're both wrong. That's why you have the Seventh-day Adventist, the Catholic, the Presbyterian, because the Bible is subject to interpretation. All our language is a lot of stuff. It's subject to interpretation, except chemistry, physics, mathematics, engineering is not subject to interpretation. When engineers talk to each other, it, they talk of the tensile strength, compression strength, torsional strength, so the language is not subject to interpretation. And if you take a blueprint of an automobile from America and bring it to Japan, they turn out the same product, not subject to interpretation. So it appears that most of the language of science and technology is not subject to interpretation. When you talk to somebody, I say, I think this is what he means, and it goes through their head and comes out different. He says, that's not what I meant. Of course he's going to have trouble. A lawyer is a guy that takes language, twists it around to any way he wants to. If he's skilled at it, he can knock you out, put you in jail. A lawyer would be considered a criminal in the future. So would all bankers, and all businessmen, and all politicians. Don't forget, you're brought up to believe that King Solomon was a great guy. He had a thousand lives. He'd be arrested today as a bigamist. <laughs> so all the things that you're taught, are they teach you to fit in with this culture. All civilizations are established. And they're established on the basis that kept those in power in power. So they still run the show. Now, I'm not saying they're good or bad, they've been conditioned. That seems normal to them. So if you were raised by the headhunters of the Amazon as a baby, and I went to you and said, doesn't it bother you to have ten shrunken heads? I said, yes, my brother has twenty. <laughs> <laughs> Is he bad? No, that's the way he was brought up. So you see, there's no such thing as thinking things over. You think within the context of the way you were brought up. If you ask an Eskimo, what do you want? You can have anything you want. He can't say a stainless steel air conditioner. It is not within his environment. So it's very hard for so-called normal people to step outside of the environment. If you ask an Eskimo, uh, do you ever dream of walking on a Palm Fringe beach with coconuts 
and sunshine, he said, I don't know what you're talking about. He's not a bad guy. Now, in the early days in the Roman Empire, I am told that they used to feed Christians to lions. But first they would starve the lions to make a better show. Then they would take the clothes off the Christians so it would be easier for the lions to tear them to pieces. Now the family would come Saturday and Sunday to see Christians being fed the lions. And the kids would say, Daddy, can we come next week to see Christians being fed the lions? And he said, if you behave yourself. <laughs> Are these kids sick? No. They're normal to that culture. The Nazis, Heil Hitler, are normal to that culture. There are no good or bad people. There are no corrupt people or dishonest people, creative people, lazy people, all that's bunk. If you're raised in a society that understands human behavior, you don't have those variations. You can block them through education. Not the education you get. That's mostly propaganda. They condition a man to become an engineer, another man a chemist, another man a physicist. And when we go to war, the physicists in Germany fall in line with that culture. In Italy, they fall in line with that culture. In America, the scientists fall in line. If they were scientists, really scientists, they would wonder what war is. Why do people kill each other? What is the serial killer? What makes them that way? They don't fall in line. Your business is to listen to me, and if there's anything you don't understand, please, during the question period, question the hell out of me. Don't accept anything I say unless I can provide sources of information. So, so far, I just want to tell you a little bit more about people. When you study architecture, all the houses, as a rule, have a pointy roof. That's conventional. Architects do not design cities for people. They design for business. They design things that will sell. It's an ego problem. They design the tallest building. So when they invited Roxanne and myself to Dubai, they wanted me to come in and design the tallest building in the world, and the most modern city in the world, and a theme park. I said, why do you want the tallest building in the world? We want to be better than the United States. It's like England time. <laughs> the <laughs> uh, people don't understand society. And you're not, you must design for human comfort, and you must design cities with art centers, music centers, cultural centers. I can only talk a little bit about America because that's where I'm from. I don't like our country. It's completely corrupt. And that's for most civilizations today. They're all corrupt. I'm sorry to say that. I don't like what I'm saying. I wish it were otherwise. So what I want to tell you is that we are brought up in a system called established. Established means it served the interest of the lead group, the control group. What we really need is an emergent society. Emergent society means that there's no utopia, no fixed system. If I were to design a city, and that city would be a straitjacket to the kids of the future. They'll design their own cities. So if you make a statue of me, you'll hold back society. There are no great men, no great women. All people are creative, but they're not brought up to know what that means. I want to give you, most of your language should be subject to definitions, clear definitions. And we don't have that. When we say we have a great nation, what do you mean by that exactly? Another person says to me, I believe in freedom. I believe in participatory democracy. So I say, do you really believe that? They say, yes. So I say, do you vote for the Vietnam War? I guess not. Did you vote for the space program? I guess not. Did you vote for highway design, the capital building, procedural systems? No. That's just bull, bullshit. I'm sorry. But they give you that to maintain control. There's no bad language here. Maybe a few young lady drop a pie, you say, Kidly D. The man might say, Shit. That means, I'm sorry I dropped the pie. It has nothing to do with people, man. There are no bad words. Your society tries to control you continuously through radio, television, news. Now, uh, if you worked in a department store 
And a young lady came up and said, how much is that man? He said, twenty dollars. He said, I'll take two. Let's say it's a good question. He said, if you go down the street, you get the same land for ten bucks. He wouldn't be working there very long. So when they tell you that your government likes you, they're working for you, you wouldn't outsource to another country. You understand? If you outsource jobs and production to other countries, it means all they're concerned with is the bottom line, profit. And that, that's very disadvantageous to people. The profit system actually does design things to wear out and break down. Because that's the way you keep in business. <coughs> Every year you've got to buy <coughs> new airplanes, because the old become obsolete. So war has always been good business. A friend of mine, when you're drafted into the army, or you join the army, to protect your country, you put your life up for the country. So they should conscript all the war industries, so no one makes a buck of war, then it's real. On the same basis of pay of soldiers, but if you make millions selling aircraft to the army, he sells machine guns, she sells submarines, it's not honest. Now, I knew a guy named Alexander P. D. Seversky, who owns the first aircraft company. He said during World War II that we should, that the government should buy long-range bombers to knock out the power projects of Germany. If you knock out the dams and the power projects, but if you shoot soldiers out in the field, they can keep producing munitions and bombers and aircraft. You understand? Even war is corrupt. It's corrupt as an operation. A friend of mine flew airplanes in World War I, and he said he flew over Krupp munition works eight times with orders not to bomb it. He didn't understand that. He was a pilot to defend the United States. But after the war, a magazine called Fortune Magazine read an article called Arms and the Men. Probably never heard of it. And in that magazine, they said that DuPont has holdings in IJ Farm. That's why it wasn't bombed. So war is really not to bring democracy to other countries. It's about resources and exploitation and removal of the resources. National loyalty is really a form of stupidity. All people need clean air, clean water, arable land, and a relevant education. That means no businessmen, no advertising, no investment bankers. Relevant education means how to re restore the environment and the damaged reefs. Not to, you know, I don't know if I told some of you this, but the United States Army about 45 years ago dumped 65 tons of nerve gas off the coast of Miami, near the Gulf Street. How can you love the country and do things like that? How can you care about people and bomb their cities? Well, fire and press a button and wipe out cities. The reason people do that, they get a medal. They get an X on the fuselage of how many planes you shot down. I used to work for Ernst Uder, Uder. He became the head, one of the top brass under the Nazis. Well, I worked from at Roosevelt Field. And I said, how did you shoot down 70 airplanes? And he said to me, I would fly above aerial combat and watch the rookies that couldn't handle planes well and knock them off. Now, what kind of a person is that? He's a war hero, great man. Eddie Rickenback is the same. They're bums and stupid people brought up by an arrogant society that doesn't give a shit about anyone else but the established institutions. So I'm trying to tell you something. We must join together with all nations, take care of the earth together and one another. If you, when you think of the cost of World War II, I'm not just talking about the military cost, I'm talking about taking care of veterans after the war for years. And then all the cities bombed out, the museums and art. You know, you remember England and Germany, flattened out. Take that cost, you know what that could have done? It could have housed everyone on earth with brand new housing. Built art centers, music centers, cultural centers, housing, parks, 
soldiers should be trained as problem solvers, not killers. When you train people to be killers, obviously soldiers don't know what the hell they're doing. Because they think they're defending their country. They're building hatred for the next 20 years. When you bomb the Arab world and flatten it out, you're not doing any good. So years ago, when I was proposing this society, I said to myself, yeah, how are you going to change everybody in the world? They all think differently. Some people have 10 wives here in some nations. It's all so very different. How do you want to change them? That's what thinking is, talking to yourself. If I say, I'll see you Saturday, he says, I take the kids to and then he I can't see you Saturday. So thinking is nothing magic. It's, it's what you've been exposed to and asking questions. So I said to myself, how are you going to change all these people? I said, I don't know. That's the first thing you have to learn. I said, I don't know. You think we'll ever get to Mars? Nah, not in a thousand years. That's your opinion. Just say, I don't know enough about aeronautics, space travel, or the conditions on Mars to give you an answer. We don't talk that way. When we see a new airplane without wings, we say it doesn't have wings, it'll never fly. The question is, how do you propose to lift off the ground without wings? I'm a layman, not technical. If you do that, there's no argument. If you give everybody a right to their own opinion, which is we're brought up to believe that that's the right thing. If everybody in right to their own opinion, if you live across the street from me and I see 10 guys coming out of your apartment, I can have all kinds of opinions. You can be a language instructor, an art instructor, but if you give everybody a right to their own opinion, you damage communication. Just when you ask them, do you think we'll ever get to Mars? They would say, it's not my field, I know nothing about rocketry, I can't answer that. That's the way people talk in the future. They don't say, it'll never work. Scientists in the past used to write books on why man can fly. And the right brothers never read those books, so they built a flying machine. They were bicycle mechanics. Now, the right brothers really didn't just do that. In the early days in France, some guy designed a set of wings that stuck out three feet on each side. And he jumped off the Eiffel Tower, and he died. And he died. And his brother-in-law wrote, make wings larger next time. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to know. Nobody ever does anything wrong. They use whatever knowledge they have, and their decisions sometimes don't work. Now, let's talk about that. When this guy's brother-in-law wrote, make wings larger next time, somebody made larger wings, but he didn't jump off the top of the island. He jumped off a lower region. And he flew for a while, both wings went like that. And somebody, a fisherman, with a lot of rope, says, you've got to brace your wings so they don't go like that. Oh, thank you. So men build them on other men. There's no, this is going to be hard to accept. Man, this includes me cannot think or reason, all that bullshit. If you're not exposed, if, ask him about If you ask him, what do you want? You can have anything. He says, well, I like a strong igloo. He's not going to ask for a uh, prefabricated building with photoelectric cells. He can't ask for that because he's never been exposed to it. Then there's another bullshit word which is going to hurt a lot of you, love. Now let me tell you what's the matter with it. Is there anybody here that's perfectly satisfied with everything you've ever done? Of course not. So sometimes you like yourself, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you like yourself very much. Sometimes you dislike yourself. So when you get married, the same thing. Sometimes you love your husband and wife very much. Sometimes a little less. Sometimes not at all. You fall out. So love is a fluctuating thing. It's not a fixed thing. Do you understand that? Okay. So if you're brought up with twisted values, like a guy named Albert Fish, which the nation at that time, U.S., believed he ate 45 children, and the public wanted to tear him to pieces, because they were brought up that way. But a doctor named Workman, a psychiatrist, said, I want to find out what made him that way so we can avoid those conditions in the future. That's much better. When your car veers to the right, you don't kick it and beat it up. Either your tire pressure is uneven or something's wrong with the steering column, you try to understand. When people, when children beat up other people and hurt other people like a bully, 
That part of his air conditioning, that was associated with memory, it's a system they live under, which doesn't correct that. Schools do not teach you much, they're mostly concerned with propaganda. Most schools don't teach you how to live, find meaning in your own life, how to disagree without getting angry. That's what's needed. And as long as the world goes on this way, you're going to have cycles of war, depression, economic drop, but you believe in right, your own good and bad. What is really needed is the intelligent management of the Earth's resources for the benefit of everyone. Now, the only way you can do that is through technology. Everything that you have, your lights, your air conditioning, your automobile, your airplanes, all technology. Politicians can't give you that. Politicians don't know what to do. They make laws. Now, that's no way to change. Say no to drugs. Well, that's not going to stop a person from selling drugs as long as there's money in it. But if you do away with the money system and build access centers where anyone can have access to the necessities of life without filling out a million forms or appealing to Fresco, it's all available to everyone. Everything on earth is made by people that worked hard to achieve that. So a young man in Princeton got up and he said, I don't like your system at all. I said, I can't do anything with what you're saying. What is it that you don't like? He said, well, you want to give people things for nothing. I said, were you born in America? He said, yes. You got the airplane, the telephone, the radio, airplanes, ships, all for nothing. You didn't have anything to do with that, I'm sure. What? So, I said, does it hurt you? He said, no, but I don't like the idea of people getting things for nothing. So I said, are you paying your way from Princeton? He said, no, my dad did. <laughs> Is that hard you? Does that hurt you? He said, I still don't believe people want to get me deep or nothing. So I said, okay, okay. Your dad is wealthy, as I understand. He said, yes. When he dies, you want his money to go to the heart fund and the cancer fund, not to you, because you don't believe anybody already getting deep or nothing. He said, just a minute. <laughs> 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 well, I say people hardly know what they're talking about because they're not brought up to be sane. They're brought up to fit in with the establishment. So it's very hard to ask people, what do you vote for? I believe in democracy. There's never been a democracy anywhere in the world. There can't be a democracy if people have different income. If you get minimum wage and your kid gets sick, you can't take him to a doctor if you can't afford it. So he buys a used car. The used car breaks down more than a used car, and he's up to death. I mean, uh, he has to take his kid to a clinic, lose a day's pay, and he's on minimum wage to start with. So what, how do you look at that? How can you have a democracy if mothers are not educated on how to feed their kids nutritional food? Today, they pump chickens to grow faster, put ingredients in food to color it to make it look better and add artificial flavoring in many instances. And so you don't get the best food. In the future, the medics would be concerned with what, and the nutritional experts would be concerned about the food people get. Now, a lot of you have never heard of this book, A Hundred Million Guinea Pigs. Did anyone ever hear it? Nobody. In America, it was a bestseller. It attacked the drug industries and showed you why the drug industry didn't use cell reduce to lower blood pressure because there's no money in it. So they make these little pills, they get two or three bucks for it. This book exposed the drug industry and the American public it was the best seller. So we got to have a pure food and drug administration. People that want monitor that and watch over you. So they did build that, they got that. But today it's managed by the drug industry. People that run it used to work for the drug industry. So you see, everything becomes corrupt in a monetary system. I'm sorry about that. So when I say to you, go to your big department stores or your food stores, you'll see lots of stuff. We are now capable of producing in abundance. During the war, we gave soldiers airplanes that cost, uh, today anyway, or nearly a billion dollars a piece. How come we don't do that during peace? 
send every kid to college that wants to go, that would improve to all nations. But if you don't have the money to go to college, you become second rate. So we say in the future, everyone will be given the best opportunity so that we can bring out the best in every human being. No. And if you grade children, you got to see, you got to deal, you make jealousy and envy. People say to me, <coughs> excuse me, I know two people from the same environment. One turned out to be a priest, the other a gangster. If environment is everything, how do you get those differences? You get those differences by playing with the youngest child, four years old, while the seven-year-old says, you can't play with one kid, this is my, my youngest kid. You must take the older kid, put him on your lap, and the younger kid say, this is your baby brother. Never say to a girl, why can't you be like your sister? She puts everything in her place, you leave everything all over the place, I have to pick up after you. Then the sister becomes jealous. That's where jealousy comes from. It comes from poor manipulation of the variables. In human behavior, if you give one child or treat one child as your favorite, you hurt the other children. If you grade children in school, you hurt the other kids. I got an A, what did you get? F failure, you know. So people have different attitudes. So people that steal, all of us, by the way, are prostitutes in this system. If you sing and you sell toothpaste, you're a prostitute. If you get up and you say, I've got just a house you're looking for, you're a prostitute for the establishment. So there's no good or bad people now. We're perfect reflections of the culture we live in. Again, I'm sorry about that. So if you begin to think outside the box, here's what that means. I was told by a Catholic priest who told me there are things beyond the physical. He said, you're trying to make the world a better place, but there are spiritual aspects. And what do you mean by spiritual? You mean you have no locks on your door, and you bring everyone in your home, and you feed the hungry? Oh, no! So the word spiritual, if not defined by what you mean by it, a truly spiritual person carries out the teachings of religion or the finest viewpoint they can carry. Now, Jesus never wrote anything. He taught to people. And people said, I think this is what he meant. Oh, he meant that. So he got all these different things. And then God, let's say God, for example, the old God, sitting up in the clouds, and knows everything. He's omnipotent. You don't have to tell him anything. He made every bug, every tree, every galaxy. And then Jesus proceeds to insult him. Here's where he insulted him. Just before they crucified Christ, he looked up and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And God said, gee, I didn't know that. <laughs> How can you pray to a God? How can you talk to God? You can't even talk to Einstein, those people. And they're always talking to God. They think through the ego problems that they're specially selected. The Jews are God's chosen people. The Germans are the master race. You know, all these little egocentric people think that they're put here to lead the world into a better direction. I may get shot, like Martin Luther King. He tries to do something, boom, he gets shot. Now, the people that don't get shot, as a rule, are guys like Hitler. Why don't they get shot? They have a lot of guards around, and they condition everybody in the environment to strictly Nazis. So, the Nazi point of view was to protect the establishment. All money systems, as they begin to collapse and change, they move toward fascism. Always. It's part of the history of civilization to move in that direction. The wealthy people try to protect what they have. The people are told that that country is a bad country. They hate America. In a British newspaper called Telegraph, the CIA or the Pentagon released information which says U.S. intends to bomb seven countries. Nuclear. Preemptive strike. In the old days, that meant sneak attack. Preemptive strike is a sneak attack. And they named the seven countries, North Korea, China, Russia. Now, if you do that, they're all going to be building atom bombs. 
Even if the U.S. intended to do that, to release that was stupid. So that's why a lot of people building nuclear weapons. It's not cost that bad. North Korea is building big armies, rocket ships, everything. So is China. Because we ran those headlines. How stupid can you be? Military people are not right. Military people would be concerned with how do you bridge the difference between nations instead of declare war on them. So we will have a pentagon in Washington of sociologists, social scientists, who are there to try to bridge the difference between nations. That's the problem. Not killing them, bombing their cities. That's not a solution. That only builds hatred for the future, if you understand what I'm saying. So I am really putting it this way. What will people be like in the future? First, they'll learn about the earth. And they will be brought up not to want to hurt the oceans or the forest or cut them down. Some people say to me, will everybody be alike in the society you're talking about? In certain areas, yes. They won't hate anyone of a different color or different religion. They would not want to hurt anyone or kill anyone or rob anyone or hit them on the head and take their money. None of that. There will be a life in that area. There's nothing the matter with being a life in the same way, if you're sane. Now, unsane means not that you lost your facilitation. Unsane means you're brought up with artificial values. So most nations are unsane, particularly the leaders. Because if you ask any leader in the British Empire, you say, how would you stop cars from hitting each other? I don't know. How would you prevent forest fires? I don't know. <coughs> what do you do to prevent earthquake buildings from caving in? I don't know. Who the hell are they then? What are they doing there? <laughs> they tell you in America, write your congressman. You want women's rights? Write your congressman. What a jackass he is. <laughs> congressman doesn't know anything about that. When you fly in an airplane today, I'm a, well, I'm a commercial airline. You don't have to write the pilot and say you've been flying at an angle for three miles now, straighten up. He knows his business. The navigator, when you go to Hawaii and you see icebergs coming up, you say, I thought we're going to Hawaii. You don't have to write him. He knows navigation. So people that fly airplanes or manage ships, you never have to write the captain of a big line and say, look, we're going to Hawaii, but I see icebergs. You know, they know their business. Who are these people you have to write to? They must be dummies and tyrants. So they should be at the forefront of human problems in government and not trying to stop you from doing things, but to welcome you on the air. But what they do is manage news. If it doesn't look too good, you don't get it. I've never been on the air except once in America. But in other countries, when we were invited to Turkey, they gave me an hour and a half. And Turkey said, how do we build the first Venus project? Now, they invited us to Vienna. They gave me seven minutes with a whole bunch of academicians. I couldn't say anything in seven minutes. And that happened in other countries. So we don't go to any other country unless they give a chance to present what it is we wish to present. And then you get mad at it, you ask questions, that's the way to do it. But you don't get up and you don't really applaud until the guy gets through. So when the question comes, when you guys ask questions, I ask you not to be polite. And the question is how out of everything I say. And if there's things you don't understand, you have to let me know. Now, how many of you know there are metals today with a memory? It's called shape memory alloys. How many of you saw it in our film? Okay. There are metals today with a memory. And they only they who invented it. Some Swedish guy, a metallurgist, was mixing different metals together. And he mixed nickel and titanium together. And he bent it and left it on a table near a heat lamp and it straightened out again. He didn't sit down and invent it, he discovered it. Nobody ever invented anything. They tell you in school that somebody invented the wheel, and that's the beginning of the technical age. A tree fell over another tree, and people pulled it, and it rolled. No idea how that the wheel. And that's all 
And that rod rolled, if there was one stone in the way, it stopped the log from turning. So they shaved the bark off, this took a long time, in the middle, so that the midsection was thinner and the wheels were on the outer section. So nobody sat down and invented wheel or invented anything for that matter. Now, I said that they invited me to speak at Princeton University and the name of the subject, man can't think of reason. That made everybody angry in the university because they all knew that that could think of reason. So a guy from the optics department said, I don't agree with you before I even said a word. I said, well, what is it that you don't agree with? He said, man can think of reason. I said, give me one example. He said, well, there was not a camera at one time and somebody had to think about it. Now in China, a thousand years ago, they, if you were in a dark building, there was a little hole in it, you saw people walking upside down on the wall. If you've been in a barn which is very dark and there's a knot hole in it, you'll see cows walking on the wall upside down. If the sun's out and the barn's dark, that's where the pinhole camera came from. Nobody sat down and said, we've got to make a camera. <laughs> <laughs> what about the negatives? Somebody had to make a negative. The American Indians used to take berry juice and squeeze it on mats they made for the floor of the wigwam. They'd squeeze blueberry juice, cherries, and so they get patterned. But if a leaf fell on the berry juice, they picked it off, there was a print of the leaf. That's where the print came from. And people walking barefoot in the sand suggested the molds. And they said, when you make a mold, you put something in it. Nobody can sit down and invent anything. The first guy that tried to fly died. Probably the first hundred guys that tried to fly died. So if you do medical research and you work for three years on cancer and he finds out what doesn't work, I read this book and two years later I come up with a little bit of an approach to cancer. I get a Nobel Prize, he gets nothing. There's thousands of people just as sincere that work on problems that don't come up with an answer. You should never give a Nobel Prize to one person. All these people are hardworking trying to find the answers. So when you start giving out medals or jobs in a beauty contest, the girl gets an award. Did she make her face? Like soft as her and mold it in a <laughs> Then you give her some kind of medal. So if she's born that way, what the hell is that? <laughs> So the world we live in is a full ship and a crystal turkey. And you're not about to talk to people and turn them around. You have to demonstrate it. The shape memory metals that I was talking about is made of nickel and titanium. It's a wire. And you took that wire and bent it in form so it fell down Jesus Christ. Put it on a table, put a hot lamp over it, straighten it up and put it on a table and go like that and to go back to Jesus Christ. You can build a following. <laughs> now most people don't know where the earth came from, they don't know where life came from, and so they invented a God who made a man and a woman, then he kicked them out of that beautiful body. How did he do that? Snakes used to walk upright. And the snake said, eat of the fruit of knowledge. Who made the snake? God. But he loves you. Who <laughs> <laughs> around with your best friend's wife? That's what the tempter was. So the snake was finished so bad that God got angry at what he created. And said, from now on, you have to crawl on your belly. <laughs> so there, that's another thing they have about horses. The reason a horse leaves standing up, because some holy man wants to ask this horse to take him across the river. And the horse said, no, you don't have to sleep standing up. <laughs> we have all this stupidity. Galileo found seashells on the mountaintop. He took it to the Catholic Church and he said, maybe the mountain was once under the water, it was pushed up. And the church said, no, the devil put that stuff in it for the Anybody that believes in God, you must think that the kind of God man makes more like themselves. The guy that gets angry, creates flood, disease, that isn't God. And if you don't follow the Bible, according to God's teachings or your religion, you burn eternally. That sounds more like a psychopath, not a <laughs> So, if you believe in 
I asked Einstein once, do you believe in God? He said, which one? <laughs> I said, well, you knew that the Jewish God says, if a man takes his son's eye out, you take his son's eye out. An eye for an eye, a tooth for two. The Christian God says, when a man strikes it, turn the other cheek. That's what he means by which one. All these gods are jerks that man makes. They're not like themselves. They get angry, create floods, disease, all kinds of things. And you say, why did the bubonic plague kill half of the earth's population? And the church would say, uh, we shall suffer for the sins of our parents. Scientists, when the bubonic plague began to wipe out people, they said, we don't know why that happens. That's very good. I don't know. So they found that fleas that live on rats infected people with the plague, and they began to kill the rat population and wipe out the plague. So I don't say science is perfect, but it's closer to our problems than any other system. So when man makes laws, it means they don't know how to solve problems. All man-made laws are BS, bad science. All man-made laws don't deal with problems. They make a law. What you really need is, uh, it says, drive safely, safely on the highway, slippery when wet. So you put a brace in the highway so it's not slippery when wet, and take away that sign. It also says, drive carefully, school children crossing. I'm sure you've seen that. We design a highway that looks like one cone intersecting another cone. And when the kid presses the button, the highway turns up like that. So no car can hit the kid. You understand that? That's what you really want. You don't want a sign out there. These dummies that are politicians are not technical. Now you're going to have to take my word for it because most of you don't look old enough. When I was a kid, trolley cars had a platform along the side. And if people were late to work, they got on that platform. And they were hit by cars. So the conductor said, get in the car or off the platform. I had a small rubber tube, not very hard to hurt you, but get in the car or get off the platform. When people are late to work, they still remain on the platform. A lot of people were killed in 10 years. Finally, they took that problem to an engineering firm. And the engineer said, what do you want? We don't want people on the platform, so they retract their platform. When you got in the car, it turned out that was the end of the problem. People really don't know what to do, so they put up as a thou shalt not steal, don't steal, don't be dishonest. That doesn't change people. You can go to Sing Sing prison, you see guys with a cross around their neck. And I remember during World War II, how the minister of my church at that time, he blessed the war time, and he blessed the soldiers. He was Catholic. And in Italy, they were blessing the war tanks there. Same priest, <laughs> same religion. Religious people are extremely stupid because if you open the Bible, you'll see that Noah's Ark would have to be at least a mile long to take two kinds of every animal. And where do you get the polar bear and the giraffe? You know, and the, the ship would be so full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and the stories in the Bible are not bad, they're fantastically elementary. Stupid stories about Moses lifting up his wand and then the Red Sea party. God could put the people on the other side of the Red Sea without party. Just go like that. <laughs> and they say that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that others might have eternal life and not perish. Well, when you examine that, the witnesses, according to the Bible, say after Jesus was good, he arose and went back into heaven. Where the hell's the sacrifice? <laughs> and say, well, read your Bible, don't take my word for it. It's such a bunch of garbage written by very ignorant people, like our language was designed hundreds of years ago. That's why I say we can't talk to each other. And that's why lawyers exist. They can take language and do whatever they want. So the books are available on our website and on our books. One is called Mind in the Making by James Harvey Robinson. If you want to know communications better, it's uh, The Tyranny of Words by Stuart Chase. And if you get these books, they don't put society together for you, but they deal with communication, they deal with different aspects. 
Then there was a guy named Sir Jagada Chandra Bose. Did anybody ever hear of him? He came to the Royal Society with new ideas, and they laughed at him. And he went back to India, the boat was there. When the British people, scientists, went to his lab, they were amazed, brought him back to England, and they was minded, surge thought his chunder boats, because they checked things out. Scientists don't always check things out. They say, they would want to know how all of this began. Where did the word beginning come from? The Bible. So they said, the Big Bang. What was there the day before the Big Bang? Where did God come from? Who made him? How did he get the job? You know, no one <laughs> They all say, why do they believe in God? Because they've never been told enough about how nature works. You can take a steel ball and heat it to a half a million degrees and it becomes a vapor, but it doesn't stop existing. It still exists as radiant energy or vapor. So in science books it says matter cannot be created or destroyed. That means that it never began. This notion about even if I kick the bucket, if you bury me one foot down in the soil, all the plants get taller above me, all the worms get fatter. So what happens to fresco? It becomes part of something else. But the stuff you eat is what you are. Your cells, if you eat chicken, a cow meat, it's kind of human cells. So the stuff you are made of the stuff you eat, you plants, things of that sort. That was always here. And when you kick the bucket, the gases go off into space, the material is eaten by worms, the soil absorbs something. I don't like that. Sure, I wish I lived in land where everything was okay. <laughs> and I had white wings. <laughs> <laughs> now, all the angels painted on the ceiling in church, the wings are too small. <laughs> now, if the angels flew without wings, that would be a miracle. <laughs> and then you take people that commit crimes and you put them in jail for 20 years of their life. That is understanding. Judges would all be considered criminal because they know nothing about the background of prison. If you're brought up in Japan and you're told American bank stock, all American bank stock. In Germany, American, Coca Cola and cigarettes. That's the very punish. So if you're born in a certain country, you're made to hate during the war. Like I used to sing in school, singing Paris Hole and Fan and Paul Ross Japan, how nice the Japanese were. When they attacked Pearl Harbor, I was kind of disappointed. And there was a book called The Secrets of Pearl Harbor, which I bought. And Admiral Halsey opens that book with how we got the Japanese to attack Pearl Harbor. I never knew that. I never knew how corrupt war was. I never knew how corrupt our government was. I'm talking about America. Most, one of the most corrupt countries in the world. I'm sorry about that. There's nothing I can do about it. All I can do is get up and talk this way. I'm not your enemy. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to tell you that if we use science and technology, this is what I mean by that. They do a survey of the global resources. Once we do a survey of how many concrete hospitals we have, we know how many people we can treat. Or you ask Congress, what do you think, what do you think, what do you, what do you know, not what you think. So what we would do in the future is do a global survey first of what the carrying capacity of the Earth is. And that's the carrying capacity means how many people could live on Earth. If you say overpopulation, that's not based on the study of the carrying capacity. But if you produce more people than the Earth can carry, you'll have territorial disputes, killing, robbery, taking possessions. If two nations control most of the Earth's resources, you're going to have trouble. It's not the wind up with territorial disputes. So it's a way we operate to produce the conditions. Just as you make jealousy and envy. If my wife fell in love with somebody else and wanted to leave normal people and say, you're not breaking up the home, you little friend, you know. <laughs> the question is, it means you're not meeting her needs, it doesn't mean you're there. If the husband seeks other women, he may be tit men, leg men, ass men, a hair men, and a girl with all these different values in this system. If you cover a girl, you're going to create problems. So 
So I went to the South Seas when I was 21, and I lived on the island of Tuamotu for a while, chain of islands, near Tahiti, French territory. Everybody on the island was new, except when men climbed trees, they wore kind of a jock strap to prevent their balls from being caught. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody walked around new. And the interesting thing about it is I never saw a native stare at a girl's body. Only her eyes. When you talk to a woman, you know, they get a lot of that. The <laughs> <laughs> civilization to cover the girl. The people swam nude when they were this high, you couldn't sell pictures of a nude girl. Do you understand that? It's when you cover them up. Because it's like curiosity. No kid in the islands was a peeping Tom, because everybody walked around nude. You couldn't sell a magazine, a girly magazine. You couldn't run a pornographic movie, it would have no meaning. They made love when they were able to. And nobody was sure or not. Interesting thing, I get to know the natives so well, I watched them make love. They stroked the whole female, the top of her head, all the way down. They had no fetishes. They were no tick and leg and that, all that's made by culture. And if you don't use that kind of language around women, you can't become equal to one another. So you have to tell them how men think. That isn't how they think. That's how they're brought up. When guys poke each other, they get a load of that trick, you know? <laughs> that is the culture. In the islands, they never did that. It's like you, stroking a dog. You stroke the whole dog. You don't stop at the ball. <laughs> picture if we talk in terms of implementation, we're going back and forth, they all agree. 
want to do a major motion picture to show what life could be like in the future, show what we're missing, because most people have no idea. We look at it as kind of um, therapy for, for transition, social therapy for transition. And we'd like people to walk out of that film and say, well, why don't we do this today? At the end of the film, we'd like to show that we're breaking ground on the first city. We'd like to build the first city. And in the first city, we would have the planners for the next city and people who are making um, all sorts of media, books, videos, gaming, everything to introduce this, this direction. Because it's really an educational system an educational problem at this time. They have to understand it. It's not that they, we could just build a city and then have people move in. They don't have a good understanding of this. So this is what we need. We see how we need to go. And we have the first city and people from all over the world who come and then hopefully build another city in, in their country and go on like that. Um, could you talk a little bit? Um, could you talk more about the technologies that would be used um, for the cities beneath the ocean uh, to deal with the pressures and other things that you may want to talk about? What, what's it for? They're not cities under the ocean, that's a mistake. The cities of the sea are designed to restore the reefs. When well, I say we've done 65 tons of no gas to clean out all the ships pump their bills into the ocean. You can't keep doing that without destroying the ocean environment. And the Japanese are overfishing, according to some countries. They're overfishing because they can sell it. But, and, and in Africa, natives are killing animals. They're called butchers. If you don't supply food for them, and they have no access to food, they're going to be poachers, whatever they can do to get by. Well, exactly how, how like, some of the structures you showed on your, uh, your video at the start, there's, there's some buildings and structures on the... Well, you have to put the mic up there. Sorry. My observation is sensitive. That's a Yeah, but more exactly, how would you do it? How, how, can, you, how can you build in, in, in these sorts of remote places that the actual technology that would reduce? I, I understand the social implications, but more of the actual the kind of physics of it. We need preparation, and these guys are going to work to the Well, we have multi-decked agriculture hanging under the cities of the sea. And there are many things you can grow in salt water, food. And then we would build a hydroponics farm in the city. Hydroponics is soilless agriculture. Where areas of the earth do not have arable land, we will build hydroponic farms, soilless agriculture. And we will, instead of sending packages of food or to, to Africa or India, what we would do is dehydrate the food, take the fluids out, so that a vat this size will feed many people. So the technology of the future is to keep sonar running through the oceans, all through the oceans. The American military already has sonar in most of the oceans to detect enemy submarines. So we will use sonar for Tsunami. If you get a big wave, it notifies every land around there that the tsunami will be there in five hours, in two hours, you understand? But if the tsunami comes suddenly, there's a, I don't even understand this, there's a concrete wedge in the ocean, a half a mile away from the island, and that parts the waters so it doesn't do damage. But building a dam in front of the whole island is the only way, the wrong way. It's good for contractors building a dam. Yes. Sorry. Hi. Uh, sorry. Hi. Uh, is it possible to make a peaceful transition to this economy, say through one industry at a time, or does the system have to completely fail before it's possible? We don't think there's enough time for people to make a peaceful transition. That's just not where they're at. They're not looking for anything else. Most people really aren't educated well enough on, on behaviorism, on the systems that society 
promote. And it, it, unfortunately, it looks like it would take a crash before people look for something else. They have to become disillusioned with their elected leaders and be homeless before they look for other alternatives. And then it's usually what's in it for me. They look for the wrong reasons. I can't. But he has had a long time. <laughs> got this going. What are all the different ways that we can help the Venus project? Yeah, different ways that we can help the Venus project. Um, well, there's there's how to get involved on our website. And on the Zygotes Movement site, there are a lot of things that you can do. We also have the Venus Project design team for technical people that can go and sign up at the VenusProjectDesign.com, right? That's going live today. Um, animators are doing hundreds of, of animations of Jacques sketches, and he has literally thousands of them. New inventions, new designs for a new world. We'd like to use some of those in the film. And uh, I'd like to use them in our films, and Peter Joseph will be using some of them too. Um, really help in any ways that you can. If you really can't do anything, if you're not in a field that you can help with, get our material, learn as much as you can about it, and talk to others. Because as I said, it's really an educational uh, problem right now. You know, talk about the new value system. And if you do yeah. nothing, nothing will happen. We, we have no power. Do we don't have any money. We can't make it happen. A lot of people come to us and say, well, you should be doing this, or hey, how about this idea? And they put it on us, and we're up to here with our work now. We work all the time. So we really like people to come with ideas and, and see what, how they can implement it, and we'll work with you. Okay, got the top now. Um, Jack, in regards to eliminating money um, bartering and sort of trade value, um, one example we thought how this might come in automatically is, is products that are made with personal touches. If someone as a hobby makes a piece of furniture or you know clothing that has a personal touch and other people want it and they attribute value to that, would bartering not start coming back in as a result? You're talking about if there's scarcity of, of something that many people would want, you feel if, if there's scarcity as a result of someone having a personal touch to something that they made, you know, to, in terms of arts and crafts, and other people would like a piece of that. Do you think people would start bartering for things that are scarce, like art pieces? Only okay. during the transition. But if you have, a, say you have a collection of a 10 or 15 paintings on very famous artists, after the social change. We ask you please, why don't you put your paintings out so all people could enjoy them? He said, no, they're mine. So we put that in the newspaper. He said, no, they're mine. <laughs> <laughs> so we see people would be inclined if they have a wonderful collection of medias or personal collections, that would circulate around and show everybody. Because personal possessions is almost shameful. If you make a painting, you can't sell it, you can give it to people that you like. That's the beginning that will help human beings. But if it's a monetary system, you're going to have problems. <coughs> yes. Hi. Um, if a survey of the world's needs is completed and we identify that we don't have enough, um, who decides on how those resources are used and would we find ourselves in a controlled society where, for example, in China you can only have one child, or this year we can't have any children because there's not enough resources. So really, who would control the resources? <coughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but during World War II, we formed a blockade. So Germany couldn't get to Sumatra to get rubber. So they invented synthetic rubber. The Germans were highly technical. I'm not upholding them. I say if your country has technicians at the high point, they're very easy to solve all scarcity problems. And there's nothing that man can't work on or overcome. Like the Arab world didn't have the weapons we had, so they took over airplanes and hit it, and the uh, two towers 
And because there's no way you can secure yourself. They say at the airport, we x-ray your baggage and all that. I can design clothing that gives all the poison gas fabric. There's no way you can really protect yourself. Because whatever you think of somebody else out there has a brain too. They can think around that. You know what I mean? The only security is one world sharing resources other than war continuously. Now that, if you don't understand what I'm saying, raise some other questions about it. But who would control those resources, Jack? Who would control those resources? Okay. When, when you have the change, the social change, I don't think you want to control those resources. So the resources be allocated first to hospitals where people are needy and they can't access those things. And it would be used in terms of the most appropriate thing. For example, if a ship is sinking today, it's women and children first. What I would do is, do you know anything about navigation? Yeah, get on the boat. Can you catch fish at sea? Yeah, get on the boat. Then women and children. So women and children is a kind of a hangover that's pleasing to people, but it doesn't solve the problem. It's the same thing with resources. Resources are allocated to the most needed places. And people are told that it's just a matter of three months or four months, they'll be able to make a substitute material. Bear with us. Now, if some people can't bear with us, they're help. They're not putting the person. You know, first of all, people would have to agree that they want to go along with this direction, which is really no control, but the intelligent management of the Earth's resources. If they want this direction where we use all the resources in that way, then, then we lay out the plan of how to feed, house, clothe, and educate people. So, you know, if they go along with this, then there's a procedure that we carry out. Because that's the end goal. The control is the end goal. And there, there won't be people in position of power to control resources. They don't make policy. The scientists do not make policy. We have a direction that's laid out, and if they want to go along with this, the Venus Project, then then that allocates it. And it's not even that. We take a, a survey of the Earth's resources, find out where we need different things. If we find that there are many people diseased in a certain area, we, we have more hospitals there. Because that's the end goal, to take care of the needs of people. I'd like to give you an example. Two million people die every year in Africa of malaria. And they spray poisons in the water. And that spreads all over the place. That's the way we solve problems today. In the future, we have a light under the swamp with a color spectrum turning, and that attracts a malaria mosquito into the swamp. At night, they drown, and the fish eat them, and we get more food. <laughs> you understand? Okay. There are other ways of doing things other than strain poison. When you've got termites, you live in a wooden building, you get termites. We don't have any wooden buildings. They can burn. So we make composite material that don't burn. Now, if you say, well, I like a wooden house, then it's your problem. <laughs> you get all these problems in terms of control when there's scarcity. And then you have an advantage group that con controls the, the resources. That's what we're trying to make a proposal to eliminate, to eliminate the problems that they have today trying to design a society that, that, that surpasses the needs of control groups, of politicians, of aberrant behavior. And if you want that, then we work towards it. Good question here. Okay. Um, I got a lot of questions from the last week's lecture in Copenhagen, where a lot of people asked me, and all these technologies we see in the video, are they really developed fully and operational? I mean, could you do this tomorrow if you had the funds? Could have done it in 1927. It's not the technology that's the problem. It's the value system. Do we have the technology to build this today? We could have built it in 1927. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
also, <clears throat> there's just something that worries me about the whole zeitgeist thing. Um, there's a very clear illustration of how capitalism was, is operated, and a very clear illustration of how the Venus uh, project uh, could be, but the, 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 the area in the middle seems to be very misty. Roxanne, uh, you have said that perhaps uh, a new society could be formed bit by bit by each country building a city all over the world, but this reminds me of cooperatives in Kibbutzim, which were um, subsumed by capitalism itself. What I envisage is a, a, a system where we elect zeitgeist um, delegates to the various parliaments all over the world, um, and it results in a situation where there's a worldwide mass referendum uh, to canvas public support, and only then will we know um, whether people want uh, a Venus project or not, because this movement is going to grow inexorably to the extent that it will become unwieldy and fast. And I think without a mass referendum, um, we, we cannot get to this next society. Would you agree with me? We're all for any method that helps. You know, but first they have to be introduced to it and know what it's about. Yes. But um, we don't see it going that way towards in a, in a political manner because you know you have to raise a lot of funds to get to get out there, and then you're backed by certain people and you owe favors to certain people. So I, I think there will be a I mean, we feel it'll be a big enough mass movement as things start to fall apart and we can get the ideas out there that we don't need to go that route. But if we if there's and if some people want to do that and you get a referendum, fine. Any way you can get exposed. Yeah, we're not we're for any any way that works. Um, um, my question is basically because technology runs the resource-based society of the Venus Project, obviously. What's to stop like the people who are scientists, the technology scientists that control the fabric of the society, rather than over someone whose job is painting to give to their friends for free? You're worried about the scientists controlling yeah, what would you what would you propose to prevent the people who actually run the fabric of the society rather than the artists who paint for their own fulfilling joy to give to other people? You're worried about the scientists being corrupt or being yeah. elitism? You're worried about elitism within the scientists. Okay. Uh, scientifically, somebody said that to me. What if somebody comes along that's ten times as bright as you are? I'll get the hell out of the way. If they can make my life better. You see, I'm not threatened by unemployment. No one would be. So you have no reason to egotistically fight other people because you all have a high standard of living. Let me put it your way. The people under the Venus Project in the future will live better than the wealthiest people today. If you don't understand that, the middle class American, that's where I come from, lives better than kings. They have air conditioning in their car, television, cell phones. No king ever had that. But if you turn science and technology loose for the benefit of everyone, the smarter your kids are, the richer my life. If I try to egotistically say, well, I thought of that first, you know, all that sort of thing, which you have today, which is very damaging. Don't forget, people today are damaged. The people to get trained and exposed to the Venus Project learn how to build prefabricated houses, how to solve water shortage problems. For example, there are floods all over America. And they don't harness that water and put it in water storage spaces where we did strip mining and loused up the earth. We can direct all flood waters and harness that. Today, people flood it out of that and they sell water for a bucket glass. Because we don't, we're not, the politicians don't know what to do. And scientists don't have any advantage. No, no group has any advantage to access to anything. So there's nothing that they can hold over someone else. And they don't, they don't, they don't rule things or hold decision making over other people. Everyone has access. Let me put it your way. If you come up with a good idea and you lift when you speak, people may not vote for you. So we get people that can read and speak very well and they present different programs. You vote on it, there's a guy in a wheelchair, all twisted up, I got him on his feet. It's the ideas that count, not how they look, are they tall, they're good looking, or vote for them. You see, we're so warped today, we can't hear things from a person that doesn't look as good as 
question in the back. So, uh, I see the current monetary system as a, a huge hurdle uh, for the uh, realization of uh, the Venus project and a uh, resource based economy. Uh, do you think that we should tackle the monetary system first in order to get there, the sort of an intermediate step? Uh, or do you think that the problem is solved on its own? And when I say tackle the system, I mean propose alternative systems like interest free economy, etc. Funding is a major problem, as I seem to understand today, in order to make this happen. You don't have funds. The people are too worried about, it, about uh, making ends meet today. They don't have enough money, so it's difficult to draw people into this. So how do you get funds? Maybe sh we should work on the monetary system first. We work on the monetary system first to get funds to, to make it. Uh, we're all trapped. We live in a monetary system. You have to pay rent. To buy food, and you have to prostitute yourself in order to get money. So I don't know. The transition will be painful. There will be problems. People will shoot other people. You know, there's nothing I can do about the transition. Transition has always been painful. It depends on how much work you do to enable people to understand. If you leave here and do nothing, I can assure you nothing. What about proposing like you. What you do, if you tell people how the Venus Project attempts to solve problems, what their approach is, if you don't know how to talk that way, look at the venusproject.com. And there we have thousands of questions and answers. And we have various descriptions of the type of energy we're going to use, how it's used, where to get it, how to do it. There's a how-to all through the Venus Project. It's not about, we don't know this, we don't know that. There are a lot of people like that. But all my life I've been gathering information on how to deal with that. I used to teach dogs how to lead the blind. And when I was a kid, they used to walk with a white stick. Then thereafter, I designed a gadget that you wear in your ears that generates sound and you can hear an open door so a blind man never banged into it. And he came in the room, he could hear the shape of the table acoustically, just like a bat flies and it's semi-blind and it avoids obstruction. Why can't we do that for the blind? They don't have to live in a city for the blind. All they do is have these things at work. So when I trained these dogs to leave the blind before that, People used to come over and say, what a nice dog. And I said to them, I trained that dog to lead the blind, but I could have trained him to tear Japanese soldiers to pieces. The dog isn't good or bad, it's the way it's brought up. Do you understand that? Do you have anything specific uh, on interest-free economy in the Venus project? Like getting real interest, usually. There is no money in the Venus project. There is no interest. There's no barter. There's I mean, no as, as a transition, uh, now we live in a monetary system. So getting to into the street economy as a, as a bridge to that, as a proposal. Well, excuse me, sorry, I just finish your one. Transition would be allocation of resources, meaning if you have a law where you put it in the center so different people can use it when you're through with it. Bicycles are all there for your use. We will, in other words, <coughs> the industries fail during self change. Chevy, General Motors fail. We bailed them out. We gave the money to the people that created the problem, meaning our system is basically corrupt as hell. If you take public funds where teachers can earn more and you give it to the banks and the establishment, that is insane. That's corrupt. So the reason you don't have a smooth transition is because the politicians are ignorant people. They know investment banking, advertising, resource management, and these are important professions that will help people. The professions, my people come to me and say, what should my child study to have a job in the future? A, a profession you never heard of. The profession will be new in the future. There'll be no banking, no advertising, no profiteering. Do you understand? 
The professions of the future will be environmental restoration, taking care of health of people, from youngsters to old people. All get health care, whether you have money or not. There's no money in this country. So you can't pay off anybody. You can't buy a Congress at all. If, as long as you've got money around, you're going to have corruption. No matter how many nice laws you invent, it doesn't work. And if you make money selling drugs, and as they say no to drugs, you're some kind of a pinhead that's going to respond to say no to drugs. A pinhead wrote that, the wife of the president. Real stupid, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you very much for a very refreshing talk. I really enjoyed it. But I'm going to press you on the point of the transition between the current and present corrupt um, state that you've described, which I think many of us would probably agree with, and the rather wonderful picture you paint of the future. My particular point is about the, the they that is supposed to exist or not exist. I was interested to hear your comment, Peter Joseph, insist that there was no such thing as they, some kind of corporate entity that um, is finally responsible for all this corruption and unpleasantness. Um, but on the other hand, you this afternoon have said pretty explicitly that you think and recognize that there is such a group as they, what we may call the powerful as the corporate entity. My question to you is, surely those people are not going to give up without one hell of a struggle. You've said it's going to be painful, but have you any idea just how painful it's likely to be? These people will not give up without a struggle. They've already demonstrated their willingness to countenance death on a large scale, pollution, misery. Do you think they're going to stop? Do you think they're going to be, as Peter Joseph suggested, nearly embarrassed when you tell them your wonderful message? I suspect it'll be a lot worse than that. No, they will continue to object until their business collapses. And that's what happened. Banks are collapsing, General Motors is out, so we gave them money and bailed them out. But General Motors will not succeed because there's not that much purchasing power out there now. Not only that, General Motors never submitted a design for a car to the public to look at, which gets more miles per gallon, lower in cost than Japanese cars. They have no project. And if they have no project, it'll fail again, and the bailout will not occur again. You have to let this system go right into the crash. That's where it's going. And it has to crash, unfortunately. I wish people were sane enough to say, how can we make a better future for humankind? They don't say that. They're all just protecting themselves. General Motors, Ford, all corporations tend to protect themselves. I didn't make it that way, that's the way it is. Jack, uh, there's another group of people that I'm sure you've heard of uh, in India. Uh, they live in a city called Oroville. Um, they have a kind of different approach to the same problems that we're discussing this kind of forum. I'd like to just uh, hear your thoughts on what's going on there. We're really not that familiar with their, their approach. We've never heard it. Never heard of We've seen some pictures of what they're doing, but... Okay, well, thanks. Okay, there are a group of people called technocrats, and they believe, uh, they believe in making a technical society in America. But if you don't deal with the world, the Chinese will do nuclear experiments, the Russians will live. You can't live to yourself anymore. I've had people come to see me, wealthy people, and say, can you design a city, city of sustainability for us with a wall all around it? I said, look, people are not as stupid as they used to be during the last depression. They can want stuff over your wall. <laughs> if you're eating and living well, nobody can slip around and starve you while you're living well. The idea of living to yourself comes from the old world. We must move toward the brotherhood of humanity. This is where all religions try to do, but they don't know how to do it. If religious people understood the Venus project, this is exactly what religion is about. 
because they say, well, you're concerned with the material world. You want to build new houses and roadways and transportation. And they said to me, my kingdom is not of this world, it's up there. So I say, you forgot the Lord's Prayer. Jesus said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no money in heaven, no business, no private ownership, no banks. If you can't get that through your head, then you're close. I do not come here to attack anything. I'm just trying to say there is another way. Let's look it up. Look up the Venus project. Try to become very familiar with it so you can talk about it and not project. Like a lot of people tell me, a bunch of scientists in gray telling us what to do. You will work in Area D. You, Area K. That comes from Hollywood. 1984, Brave New World, Atlas Shrugged, all these are systems to keep you from putting in a new system. So it's written by Hollywood hacks, not scientists. Even Star Trek, they kill each other with laser weapons, blow up spaceships. This isn't the future, this is a psychopath's idea of the future. <laughs> I want to mention something about the transition, because people always took this transition on us. And uh, we work all the time, we've been working. The difference between the, the activists that, that are kind of the watchdog of what's going on here and always telling what's wrong, they're, it's really verbal masturbation to us because they really don't pose an alternative to direct direction. Jacques's been working on this all his life. I've been working on it for 33 years with him. If, if we don't get out there another direction to work towards that, that could work for all of our benefits and talk to other people and show it and work towards it in any, any profession in any way that you can, other people are going to do your thinking for you, and that's called fascism. So, you know, the, the transition can happen in a lot of different ways. We don't know who we will meet out there, and the more you talk about it, the more we might have access to people with funding who know that this system is full of shit and want to try something else. So, you know, that's all we can say is, is work toward it. If, if you don't work toward it, I can assure you nothing will happen. Uh, being an industrial designer myself, I'm interested what steps do we need to take and what can we take to change uh, education of designers that are shaping the world of today? And my second question is, um, how do we motivate people, whether designers or scientists, to work and contribute to the system uh, if everything is available freely to everyone's use? So why would someone choose to work um, all day and all life uh, of just... Okay. You're assuming that everybody has enough money to live well, they do nothing. That's not true. People with lots of money don't find enough time in the day. They're educated to do things. So I would say, years ago, uh, again, talking to myself, how are we going to change this world? And I talked to and designed the system. Then I said to myself, how do you know it'll work? I said, I don't know. So, I don't know if you know this, I joined the Ku Klux Klan in Miami and dissolved it in a month and a half alone. <laughs> then I joined the White Citizens Council. They believe they hate foreigners, darks, Latins, Filipinos, all foreigners. And I joined that organization by talking like they did and then turned it around. In one month, I dissolved it completely. Then I asked a question when I lived in New York, what are the most backward people in this area? And the consensus was the Arabs. I said, what makes you think they're backward? They still believe the earth is flat. So I said, boy, if you can turn them around, that'd be pretty good proof of your system. So I called up the guy in charge. You always work with a guy or girl in charge. I called a guy named Edvise. Arab. And I called him and said, can I speak with you? He was the head of the Arab group. So he said, from where your father be born? That's where he spoke. I said, Lebanon. He says, you are an Arab? That's where he spoke. I said, air. Air means yes, in Arabic. I speak a little bit of many different languages. 
I'm not an Arab. So he says, come and saw me. Please come and see me. So I came to see him, see him and he set aside time for me and he said, do you believe the world he round? I said, yes. That means in his cousin, it can't be. So he held his hands up like this. He said, he pointed to his head to show me how smart he was. And he said, if the world he round, man fold me down here. All the water, he fold me down from the round world. He has to be flat to make the water not fold me down. So I knew here's a guy I'm dealing with that is really sincere and he couldn't understand the earth being round. So I gave him a balloon to hold in his hand and I rubbed it fast with fur. Then I put cornflakes in his hand and told him to hold it away from the balloon, not near it. And all the cornflakes, due to electrostatics, jumped up to the balloon. Does anybody doesn't understand that? If you charge a balloon or create static electricity, the cornflakes in your hand will jump up to the balloon and stick to it. So I showed him that and his jaw hit the face. He said, world he magnet? I said, air. Ah! <laughs> and he went and explained that to all the Arabs. An hour and a half I turned him around. Now even my mother, I wrote a Japanese book home one day, and she said, I don't want that kind around. Loud enough for him to hear. And I met him in California, I hadn't been home a long time. So he left, this is our Sia job. He was in America, born. And uh, I tried breezing on my mother. Which is said, try to sit and reason together. That's strictly bullshit. If my mother doesn't read and deal with the real world, she can't handle that. So reason fail. They always told me, always let us sit and reason together. You can't reason with a person that knows nothing. So I said, boy, if you can't get to your mother's job, you're not going to change the world. So I made up a story. I said, I was swimming in the East River. And there's no way to get ashore, there's a high wall. And the Sato Takashiki worked on a boat and he threw a life raft to me. My mother said, Oh my God, you mean he saved your life? And yet, she said, No, I've been so cruel and approved. I said, Yes, you have, my <laughs> And she said, Please, ask him to come back for dinner. I want to beg forgiveness. He saved your life. Oh my God, I've been so wrong. I said, Well, I don't know if he'll come back now. The reason I said that, I want my mother to plead with me. So she's pleading, please, God, ask me to come back. I feel terrible. So I called Miss Otto and said, told him about the false story of him saving my life. And I said, when you walk in the door, my mother's going to hug you and kiss you because that's the way she was brought up. So at dinner, she was really talking to him. So I walked out of the room and I came back when Masato went to the washroom. I said, Mother, what do you think? She said, you know, he's just like you and I, has a wonderful family in Japan, so I went like that. She <laughs> said, you shouldn't do that, he saved your life. He's a member of the R.O.H. He's a member of the R.O.H. And you know, they're sneaky. I said, not Masato, she said, he's a good boy. And after a month, she puts her arm around Masato, she really likes him and calls him son. Once that was established, said, Mother, he never saved my life. <laughs> she said, you believe the devil? I would have never opened the door either. So sometimes logic and reason doesn't work for some people. So you tell them a fib, get them to listen to the guy for a little while, and then you can tell them that you had to do that because you couldn't understand it any other way. Now one person, did you love your mother? I used to say in some areas, other areas not at all. So love is not a constant, it fluctuates up and down. Once you understand that, you'll understand that sometimes you love your boyfriend, sometimes not at all, sometimes you hate him, sometimes you like him very much. Love is a fluctuating system, not a constant. That's why you get disappointed. People get married, they scratch their head, they come with me to me. I don't know if I really love my husband. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Same with yourself. Sometimes you like what you do, sometimes you do. I should have done this, I should have done that. So if you were the duplicate of yourself in the same room, the question is how long will you be together? You know what I mean? 
So we are not sane enough yet. We live in the, the early stages of civilization. We are not civilized yet. If we were, there would be prisons, police, war, warships, bombers. Do you understand that? That's what I mean by we're not civilized. To become civilized takes a long time and stage by stage. There's no final frontiers. So if you say, well, I'm no intelligent person. An intelligent electrical engineer of 75 years ago couldn't get a job today. So what you call intelligent today is a jackass, as a rule, that matches the value system they gave you. There are very few intelligent people in the world that have methods of solving problems. We live on the backs of probably no more than 50 people that gave us electric lights, heating systems, power generation. It isn't the whole world that you have to convince. All it takes is 7,000 people to operate everything on Earth. You don't need millions of people agreeing with you. Who the hell do you think runs corporation? Very few people. I'm sorry again, but that's the way it is. All I can say now is thank you for attending. Do what you can. Mention that if you're interested in helping, especially in the UK here, there's a fantastic Zeitgeist movement group here, um, Andrew and Heather and Tom and others. So you can uh, get check out check out the, the UK project .com. Okay, there, right? yeah. We still have 25 minutes. Yeah. So what's else discussed? Oh no, it's the Zeitgeist movement UK project .com. Yeah. Yes, sorry, back to my question. Yes. How would you uh, change designers' education to drive them in the direction of the Venus project? How would you change education to drive them in the direction of the Venus project? You never give kids grades. If you do that, you say, I got an A, I got a failure, you build jealousy and anger. So our schools do not use words that they've learned thousands of years ago, like that's wrong. That's wrong doesn't tell anybody anything. But if you say, if a kid spells cat with a K, if you say very close, it's just one letter in J. Don't say that's wrong. No, but I mean specifically in designing. I didn't get that. In designing? In designing, yes. How should designers be educated? Not general education. In design, how would designers be educated? The parents are design. Are you an industrial designer yes, or fabric yes. designer? Industrial. Industrial. industrial design will be based to teach you the industrial design on minimum waste of resources. Never design products that wear out and break down. Do the best you can. An old Volkswagen, if you drive an old Volkswagen and I drive a Mercedes, if your brakes fail, I die. So there are no old cars on the road. They weigh as much as a new car. So everybody do not, you don't own anything in the future. The cars are lined up for your use. You have access to cars, sailboats, but you don't own anything. You live in a house as long as you like to. You can make a painting, but you can't sell it. You can give it to people. So when you do away with ownership, and people have access to the necessities of life without servitude, then you have the beginning of the civilized world. You don't have that yet. Hello. Hello. Uh, I always find myself reading articles about a scientist finding genes that may affect our personality. Yeah. Is this bullshit, or do our genes get affected by our environment? How do you? What's your opinion on on that?
to improve everyone, to give everybody the ability to be creative. You know, it, it, it diverts where the problem really is. Yeah, it's just crap. The by the way, are sincere people, but they think it's all in the genes. Actually, all you inherit, inherit may be the color of the eyes, the shape of the nose, the color of the skin, but you don't inherit values. You don't inherit bigotry and prejudice, as Rob said, that's learned. But we know of no human being that inherited. They used to think that a Chinese baby can learn Chinese faster than an English baby, because of generations of speaking Chinese. So they took an English baby and a Chinese baby. They both learned it the same way. <coughs> so you can't pass on learned uh, ability to your kid. But you can pass on a propensity toward liver disease or heart disease. That can be passed on to the genes. But you can't pass on knowledge, values, or concepts of social arrangements. That you have to learn. That's why I say, I make more mistakes than anybody I know. I also say I've never made a mistake in my life. Now that's what that means. That means the first guy that fooled with nitric acid and glycerin disappeared and the building. And the building also never fooled with that stuff. What do you think? Where do you think people get ideas from? There are no answers. If a man makes wings, head is too small and jumps off a hill, he may die. That's where the other guy learns to make the wings. You don't, you only learn through pain. Dr. Ehrlich did 606 experiments before he can control syphilis. Edison, 7,000 different elements before he found one that didn't burn out. But if you show kids movies of guys like Leonardo da Vinci, and they say he was so far ahead of his time, they never show you who he associated with. The friends of Leonardo da Vinci talk of gears and leave it. You never heard of that. No one can jump way ahead of his society. Then there's Nostradamus. Now, Nostradamus was always wanted by the French police for fraud. Did you know that? And the people that translated Nostradamus left that out and wouldn't sell. Then a guy named Frank Scully wrote a book called Behind the Flying Saucers. And they hired me to look at the evidence. So this guy said he was picked up by a flying saucer, taken around the universe, and brought back. So I said, what was the ins inside of the flying saucer like? He was a big leather belt that the hell of the place. Anybody that can fly a hundred million light years through space doesn't need a leather belt. <laughs> And he said there was a lot of blinking lights. Let's see if I can point this out. In an airplane, they had an instrument that moved and says your fuel mixture is too rich. So the pilot adjusts the fuel mixture. In the future, when the needle touches that, it will change the fuel mixture. You don't need blinking lights. You know, an advanced civilization doesn't have somebody talking on the radio like that. It doesn't have anything like that. And the fine saucer. The big one that you have, most of you have seen has three spheres underneath it and portholes. And that was a 1927 chicken burger. See the room. So all the refined sources that I have seen that people photographed were out of scale with the trees in the background. They're only this size. They said they were 500 feet in diameter, you know. So I have a way of checking those things. So I told Frank Scully, so far, I haven't met anybody. So he said, have you ever met Dr. G? I said, I've never heard of him. He said he was at White Field and he took the flying saucers apart. Now, I was at White Field during the war, making safety devices only. So I met Dr. G and I said, Dr. G, is it true that you couldn't drill through it and machine cut it with anything? He said, yes. And he said, I've taken a lot of them apart. And how did you do that if you couldn't drill them, saw them come? He said, well, I use a new method. They went together like a jigsaw. So I said, do you happen to have a piece of flying saucer? He said, yes, in my car. I said, wonderful, bring it in. I'm not close on it. So I brought in a piece of material. 
that he said we could drill through it was transparent. It looked like loose size or plexiglass to me. That doesn't mean I'm right. So I asked Mrs. Scully, can I use your oven? My time said, no, nah. gave it back to the guy. And he says, I must have brought the wrong material. Maybe he did. So I said, can you bring the right material next week? And there was a whole gathering of Scully's home. And he brought me a metal part and it still had the army serial number on it. It was the center of our Hamilton standard propeller. So I said, I brought my catalog and showed it to Scully. He said, Jack, if I put your stuff in a book, I won't sell. The same with Nostradamus. Get the French book called Nostradamus. You'll see what the real guy was like. The translation was not like that. Don't take my word for anything. I'll tell you where to get the information. Yes. Yes, I've got a question about scarcity. Um, and not with regards to production, but more about um, um, in nature. Like, for example, if you, you know the apartment buildings you showed like, in your video. Can you hold the mic closer to your mouth? <laughs> so, um, if you know the uh, apartment buildings you showed at the start in your video. Well, if a lot of people, if the most desirable one is the penthouse apartment, you know, that's essentially uh, it's a scarcity right there. And if the apartment's built in like in the most desirable part of the country, let's say, you know, who who decides who gets it? There's scarcity right there. So you can have abundance in terms of food and, and production, all these things, but there's still scarcity that exists in nature because you know we've got into the You're talking about the present day system. You see, have you seen our So instead of making pair square buildings, if you do that, most people want the corner apartment where the view is better. So we make our buildings round so the view is present for everybody and some of the buildings turn. Yeah, but you can argue that. In uh, other words, what you try to do is educate people and give them whatever they want in their home. In other words, we only design the exterior, you pick the interior. Now here's how you pick a home in the future, so you'll understand. In the Venus Project's design, you sit in front of a plastic bowl, about three feet in diameter, and you talk. You say, I want a home. The bubble is the architect. This is what kind of home. Most normal people are not sure. So different homes you get in turn. Until you say stop, something like that, then she says, I like the children's room next to the adult bedroom and it moves as you talk. And your husband or your boyfriend says, uh, I like a balcony sticking out over the pool. And the machine says, how far out? And you say, eight feet. And the machine says, if you go 12, you can have a dining area. It doesn't override you, it merely suggests. The machines are subject to the will of people. They don't override anybody. They just say, if your bumper is this high on the car and you have sonar in front of your car, you can't hit another car. Now, if you make the car of the metal metal and you get the fender, you press straight again and the fender goes back out. Who will hit you? The people that straighten our fenders. There's not a thing you can design and stand for that someone won't hate you for. No matter what. Yes. Somebody Um, Jack, I was just wondering whether your concerns about the, the planet and uh, the resource-based economy um, ties in with what scientists are saying now about our planet and the way it's moving and climate change and the fact that resources are running out at a faster rate. How do we tackle those problems and transi uh, make transition through to the Venus Project if we've only got, say, as scientists are saying, 15 to 20 years uh, on the current lifestyle that we have before we start having, seeing real problems within uh, the planet's the planet's own cycle by like climate change. Right? Can you tell me what it is? Climate change. That's not up to us. We, we have no power. It's up to you. If you don't demand that the government looks into the Venus Project, or that 
members being invited and presented on television. And you know, if you say, all I hear from is army people and military people, I don't hear new ideas. Why don't you have the Venus Project on it? That's up to you. If you do nothing, we have no power. Don't put it up. What are you going to do about the zombie waves? Did, did you put me in charge of that? I can't do anything about it. Uh, how can um, criminals and um, corrupt individuals be dealt with in a world where okay. there are no, okay. no justice system, as it were, okay. no prisons, no government? First of all, there's no money anymore, you know. So instead of, I look at everybody as criminal. Supreme Court judges, parliament, government, all the criminals. They've all been paid off. The drug companies pay off senators to carry out their problems. So what are you going to do with the criminals? When you go to a supermarket, you buy a box of Wheaties. If you open the box of the Wheaties, they're halfway down. To me, that's criminal. It's all criminals, criminals. So most people are criminals. You know, when you work in a department store, you don't say, if you go elsewhere, you can get the same product cheaper. You're a criminal. And if you're big lips, thick lips, so it'd be in thing. You put the lipstick higher than your lip. That's deceptive. The whole thing is this guy with a white collar that says, I now pronounce you, pronounce you man and wife. Who the hell is he? <laughs> <laughs> and then if you don't get a loan, some lawyer says they cost you three thousand dollars to split. Everybody makes a buck on human ministry. So I'm saying today it's very terrible because uh, People don't act always in your behalf. They act in terms of finances. And the same thing when the doctor says, I think your kidney has to come out. I don't know if he's trying to pay off a new yacht or a house, but when my kidney has to come out? I don't know. I don't trust the money system. So there was a hurricane in Florida, southern Florida, that wiped out hundreds of houses. So I designed a conical shaped building like an inverted cone. No hurricane or whirlwind can suck the roof off. On top I put a turbine. So the hurricane blows it around, keeps the refrigerators going, and the lights. <laughs> so I ask people, government does this. It says there's a terrible hurricane coming, get out of your house. Go away. So I was waiting on the freeway and I stopped and come say, where are you going? I don't know, but well, I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have a place for you. So we would have hurricane proof shelters all through the West Indies, to some detectives, high wave detectives, and the beaches would look like continuous thing, and the lifeguard would be in the middle. So you can see three beaches at the same you know, when you look into the Venus project, you'll see all these designs. We don't say we want to build a better world where everybody gets along. We deal with how you do that. Otherwise, you have nothing but a verbal hobby. That's what religion is, a verbal hobby. Do you agree that um, culture and identity are human right? And if you do, how would the Venus Project or your vision for the future preserve that right? Do you agree that identity and culture are human right? And if you do, how will the vision for the future preserve that right? Do you believe that, that uh, identity and culture are human rights? And how would you preserve that in this culture? Humans are moved out of government, number one. And government becomes cyber data. That means computers are connected to industry, transportation, and agriculture. And they produce food and transportation of goods and services. They do not control people. I want to repeat that. They do not control people. Just the production lines and factories producing goods and services. You know, so you don't have people in a position to go up there. Asking about tradition. There was once a guy that came up to Jacques and said, um, I'm Jewish. Would you permit tradition in the future? Jewish said, tradition. Yeah, Jewish tradition. And he said, sure, we'll permit traditions, but the clan meets for 25, you know, the clan's been meeting for 75 years. Would you permit that tradition? He said, no, 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 not that. So, so how do you decide? Traditions that have long outlived their usefulness 
that have no correlation with the physical world will be surpassed. If we don't have the knowledge to do that, we will hurt ourselves. For example, in Poland, they believed in the cavalry. The Germans believed in war tanks. And they wiped the hell out of thousands of Poles on horses because they couldn't make the change. In America, there was a general called Billy Mitchell who believed that airplanes could sink a ship. The Navy said never. So they put it to test and they sank two ships and the Air Force was moved up. Then came the, the, the missile men with guided missiles. They said that you don't need men in bombers. You can project a trajectory and wipe out certain factories. And the aircraft people said, you've got to have human flying airplanes. Then after the missile men got in, by the way, they got in, the laser men came. And they from outer space to the burn city, you don't need bombers. And they fought the laser men. You always got the in-group saying airplanes were good one time, lasers today. Then there's the, what the Chinese are doing. They're not building warships and airplanes. They're building computer jamming systems. That's where the future is. If you jam the computers that control the all these equipment, missiles and everything else, that's where it is. Not warships and millions of men. So if you're not smart enough to know that, you will be surpassed. Okay. Um, Sorry, we've got to wind up there now, guys. Um, Chuck's got another lecture in a couple of hours and he needs to get some rest. And I hope I hope he's answered all your questions. I mean, you know, if you can't remember everything, you can check out the Venus Project website and you get more answers than you need. Um, but just Thank put you. your hands together, Thank Jack, first come.